said yesterday in 2020, there's one focus, the health and well-being of Australians, their livelihoods, their jobs, and ensuring that Australia bounces back better on the other side. That's our focus. That's what the government is intently been working on. From the outset, back in January, we moved to get ahead. We've been working hard to stay ahead. And it's important that we all keep our heads as well when it comes to how we're addressing these issues. Every Australian has a role to play, whether you're in a government, federal, state, local, whether you're an employer, whether you're an employee, wherever you happen to be, we all have a role to play to stay together, work together, to work through this very challenging time and importantly on the other side, because there is another side uh, that we bounce back stronger than ever. The health response has always been our first response to the COVID-19 crisis that has been enveloping the world. It's a health crisis, it's a health contagion, it's a virus and that's the first thing that around the world countries are working hard to address and to ensure that the health responses are in place to support our people. There are many other implications of this and the economic consequences of this are very serious as I've already outlined on numerous occasions and tomorrow the Treasurer and I will be making announcements in relation to that response. But today it is to outline the first response which is always on the issue of our health preparedness and what, what we're putting in place to protect people's health. Today, uh, $2.4 billion is being committed uh, in substantively demand-driven programs to support the health and well-being of Australians. Uh, just, just under $1.2 billion of that will actually, uh, we anticipate, be spent this financial year, uh, particularly as the virus and its impacts ramp up in the months ahead. Uh, that health response covers the areas of primary care, uh, support in aged care, support in the hospital system, which I announced last week with the Health Minister, uh, that $500 million uh, in shared support with the states and territories, matched 50-50, uh, which, which the Premiers and I and Chief Ministers will be uh, discussing again on Friday, and investing in research. Everything from telehealth uh, to testing to clinics, hotlines, um, ensuring people can get access to their medicines, ensuring importantly that the most vulnerable parts of our community are very much in our attention. And that not just means those who are elderly or frail and in care facilities, but those who are in remote and parts of the, the country, uh, particularly those uh, in Indigenous communities. And there are specific measures that we're announcing today that go to those issues. We have a world-class health system. That is one of our great advantages. Uh, we have an economy and we have a balance sheet that enables us to address uh, this crisis, both in terms of providing for the health response as well as the many other responses, in particular uh, the response that is needed to address the challenges in our economy. Of course, uh, this system will come under stress and it will come under strain. That is to be expected. Uh, these will not be usual times and usual demands on our health system. And so I, I anticipate there will be times where that will come under great stress. That is not a reason for, for, for alarm or, 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 or concern uh, because a plan and the resource and the preparedness and the professionalism of our health system will, will attend to those needs. And so it's important that as we go through the months that are ahead uh, that we all uh, have confidence in that plan. Uh, I have great confidence in those, uh, particularly obviously uh, Dr Murphy and the, and the tremendous advice that he's provided uh, together with all of his state and territory colleagues over these many weeks now. Uh, the state governments are also very focused on this, the premiers, the health ministers. Of course our cabinet led in the health area uh, by Greg Hunt is doing exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean there won't be stresses and strains, it won't mean there won't be difficult times or days and, and waiting from time to time. Uh, but the surging of these resources into our health system, some 2.4 billion, and as I said, the majority of this is demand driven. And that means if, if there is, the demand is greater, then the resource will be provided. Um, one other point I'd make today is we received advice from the, uh, the AHPBC today regarding Iran, and sorry, regarding Italy. And uh, that advice is that uh, the situation in Italy is now commensurate with the other countries where we previously had 
travel bans put in place. And so we'll be extending uh, that travel ban to Italy now. Um, that ban will come into effect at uh, 6 p.m. this evening. Uh, that's what Border Forces advised me. And uh, effectively, though, I think it's uh, important not to overstate this. I mean, Italy itself has effectively put itself into lockdown with travel now, and uh, this largely closes that loop. Uh, we already had the enhanced screening measures that are in place. This, of course, will mean that any uh, Australians, uh, residents or others who are obviously exempt from those uh, travel bans um, would uh, be subject to the same 14-day isolation period that applies to the other countries for which there are travel bans. So, health first. That's always been our focus. This is a health crisis. We have to address the health issues. And that's what this package of measures is designed to do today. I'll hand you over to Greg and then to Brendan. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Prime Minister and uh, Brendan. Uh, today's package is the next step in supporting and protecting the health of Australians. Uh, it flows from the medical advice and it's designed uh, to cover the four pillars of the Australian health system. Uh, primary care, the aged care system, the hospital system and research, as well as providing national support underneath all of those. In terms of the uh, primary care system, uh, it's uh, a, a $615 million package, but as the Prime Minister said, uh, uncapped uh, in, its, uh, in its elements. And that is focused on expanding the capacity of people uh, to have uh, treatment, diagnosis and testing. And uh, at present, people ordinarily have access to their general practice, or to the uh, emergency department at a hospital for those in more serious circumstances. Uh, this is adding to that existing capacity. And so in particular, uh, we will be uh, creating a Medicare uh, telehealth item. Uh, what that means is that uh, you will be able to get telehealth for coronavirus uh, patients uh, through, uh, from the home. And by being able to get telehealth from the home, it both deals with the situation of patients who are isolated, but it also protects the health system. There will in fact be two groups uh, who can qualify for this, uh, those that are uh, in isolation, but also on the medical advice, uh, those that do not have coronavirus, but are vulnerable patients. And I think this was a, a very important piece of advice that came out of the primary care round table last week by working with the medical community they were able to give us that additional advice. And, and Brendan, I want to thank you uh, and uh, everybody involved in that. And that means uh, for uh, our elderly, uh, for Indigenous Australians over the age of 50, elderly over the age of 70, uh, for people with chronic conditions uh, and either uh, pregnant mums uh, or uh, parents with young children uh, who are isolated at home, uh, they can also receive advice over the phone. That means that they don't necessarily have to go uh, into a general practice or hospital environment if they are uh, uh, immune compromised. The next thing is, of course, we'll be expanding uh, the respiratory clinics. So these are what are sometimes called pop-up clinics. Uh, they will be there in addition to the general practice, the emergency department and the heli uh, telehealth. Uh, just over $200 million will be provided, uh, but if more is needed, more will be provided. And uh, that is to uh, develop uh, 100 uh, clinics across the country. Uh, and in addition to that, there will be many general practices that simply seek to have a drive-through or uh, another entrance and will be able to assist them as well. So we're expanding the ways in which people can seek assistance mm -hmm. Um, to make it easy for people and to support the, our magnificent, magnificent doctors and nurses. Uh, we're also creating a new Medicare pathology test. Uh, that's a specific test for coronavirus. It will uh, be delivered in conjunction with a flu test, so it will uh, uh, add approximately uh, $170 million uh, of support. Uh, again, that's uncapped. Uh, and that will include both the capacity for individuals to uh, uh, be given those tests on uh, the advice of medical professionals, and we will be testing in aged care homes. And so uh, these two things come together to provide that maximum support. 
Um, we've spoken with the pathology companies overnight and that's been very well received. Uh, upgrading of the national hotline, uh, provision of home medicine services, which is a, an important system. I, you know, we're expanding that capacity and that will assist people who are uh, isolated. Uh, and then also remote uh, community preparedness and retrieval where you might have an indigenous community, for example, where if uh, the virus were to break out, uh, we have the capacity to treat and to transport and then to assist. And so those are extremely important things. In aged care, uh, we'll be providing uh, additional workforce support of uh, uh, just over $100 million. That's uh, to ensure if there are temporary shortages or additional costs over and above those which they would ordinarily have. The hospitals, the Prime Minister uh, announced last uh, Thursday of a 50-50 share with the states on their in-hospital uh, coronavirus-related uh, uh, health activities and their public health and uh, 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 related activities uh, in the community. Uh, in terms of research, uh, we will invest $30 million in research into vaccines, uh, antivirals and immunotherapy or respiratory uh, treatments. That's a very important step and uh, we'll be working with the research community on that. And then finally, we'll be uh, investing over a billion dollars in national support uh, across the country and that funding goes to the uh, uh, national medical stockpile, uh, to the incident room, to modelling, uh, in particular to uh, workforce, con uh, workforce and uh, communication. So all of those things go together. Uh, the last thing is, today's goal is very simple. It's to support our magnificent doctors and nurses and to allow the public to have multiple avenues in to receive the advice and the care that they need, they deserve, and they will get. Thank you, Greg. Supplementary. Thanks, Prime Minister and Minister. Um, so these packages are really important, and as Minister Hunt has said, they were designed in partnership with the sector. Uh, we've had very good engagement, and this is what the sector's been asking for. So they're very important to respond to the current demand, but even more important to be prepared for future demand. And I do want to briefly talk about demand. We have seen over recent days a number of people seeking testing who don't need it. <coughs> we are, it's clear that there is some anxiety in the community with over 100 cases, but I say, as I've said on many occasions, a couple of things. Most of these cases are related to imports from overseas. There is only one element of significant community transmission, and that's small and controlled in Sydney. There is no point being tested at the moment if you have not travelled or if you've not been a contact, even if you have flu-like illnesses. We are not saying to people who get acute respiratory symptoms, a cold or a flu, uh, to go and get tested for COVID-19. We are saying that if you've come back from a, a, your return traveller or you've been a contact with someone, uh, who has been a confirmed case, then you should be tested. But other Australians do not need testing and all they are doing is putting an unnecessary burden on the testing. But the testing is being expanded and the new uh, package will substantially increase our capacity to test with the clinics and the new pathology service. The only other people we are looking at now is whether healthcare workers who have significant febrile illnesses might also be tested simply because of the impact of a sick healthcare worker, but we're seeking further advice from AHPPC on that. So the number of Australians who should be tested at the moment is well within the capacity of current testing, but we are expanding and getting ready. And I'm just trying to tell people to stay reasonably calm about this. We've got small numbers of cases at the moment. We do expect more, um, <clears throat> and I've also said on many occasions for most people who get this virus, it is a very mild illness. Uh, certainly we are worried about the elderly. Certainly we are worried if we have a, a large outbreak that that would put pressure on our hospitals, as the Prime Minister and Minister have said. But at the moment, uh, there is no reason for community panic in Australia. Prime Minister, will these pop-up uh, clinics appear and who will be responsible for building them? Uh, already we've seen uh, the states establish uh, clinics. Uh, we have, uh, for example, four out of Melbourne hospitals, uh, which the Victorian government has established. South Australia has uh, uh, 
pioneered a very innovative uh, drive-through model, um, I think featured on the front of one of the papers today. Uh, we have the Royal Adelaide Hospital, I know New South Wales, Queensland and other states are already doing that. So we'll be building on those and uh, we're now working through what are called the primary health networks on identifying those practices that wish to be part of this. And so we'll continue to roll them out as soon as the practice is ready, we're in a position to support. Based in GP, existing GP clinics so there are or num no? number of options here. So we're, what we're doing is entering into a flexible situation. Some general practices may choose to become dedicated respiratory clinics, and in that situation, uh, there will be very significant funding. Some, such as uh, the example of uh, you know the, the great innovative uh, Dr. Mukesh Hikerwal, uh, have established a drive-through clinic. And uh, we'll provide funds for that. He'll continue uh, the ordinary practice work in his practice, uh, but uh, where funds are needed to assist with that supplementary work. So we're creating flexible models, and uh, you know that's why the primary health networks will work with GPs across the country. Prime Minister, a few weeks ago, uh, I think it might be a fortnight ago, we were being told that the expectation was it was going to peak uh, in about April. Coronavirus. Uh, what's the latest? Uh, what are the latest? Uh, what's the latest modelling on how many people might be infected at its peak in Australia? Given that mm. states like uh, Victoria are preparing for tens well, of thousands. Andrew, I'm not sure what that April figure is you're referring to because um, the government has not been providing that type of information. We've been discussing it at the national level. Okay, fine. But in terms of what the Australian government has been saying, we, we have not in, uh, indicated um, those types of uh, horizons. Uh, the government is continuing to do modelling on these issues and working closely with the states and territories uh, because the, I mean, the profiling of how the virus extends in the, in the weeks and months ahead obviously has implications for ensuring that you can deal with any sort of keep peak capacity requirements. And that is, the, that is the very planning phase that we're currently engaged in. Um, one of the challenges to date has been that the data uh, that has been available, and these models depend on the data that goes into them. And so uh, it's important that when you're making those sorts of decisions, you're getting a quality of data. And more recently, I'm sure Dr Murphy would agree, the sort of information we're seeing coming out of Korea, where you've got a very wide scale testing program, where you have a much better handle on uh, what the level of a, a number of people is who actually have uh, the virus. And that relates also to the mortality rates. I mean, the mortality rates we're now seeing in Korea are much less than what we've seen um, based on other data. And I think that's as a result of the, the better read that you're getting on this. So at this stage, uh, we're looking for the best data to make those assessments, but the government is, is not making any public statements on that at this point. I think that would be speculative at this point, but the government is working on the various scenarios um, that would ensure uh, that we can work with the states to, to meet the demands that we would anticipate. But Dr Murphy, did you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, so modelling is a very tricky science. It, and one of the things that we've had in Australia is that we have, by a very early and quite aggressive containment methods, we're behind the curve of many other countries and we are still in containment mode. How long we stay in that mode uh, depends on the success of our public health interventions over the next few weeks. If we develop sustained community transmission, then the models can predict how long it might take to develop a peak. And, and again, those models depend on how well you contain during the development of the sustained community transmission. So there are a variety of, of, of potential models, but a, a, pa a pandemic or an, or an epidemic in Australia could, could last as long as eight, uh, as short as eight weeks or as long as 14 to, uh, to, to 16 weeks. But we don't actually know when we are going to enter that stage, if we do, of sustained community transmission. So it's really hard to predict. And certainly, it's very unlikely that we will peak in April. Dr. Murphy, Dr. 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 Murphy how Mr. far away are we from a, a vaccine? Are there any encouraging signs that you've seen? A lot of uh, research scientists are very uh, positive about getting candidate molecules. The challenge is taking a candidate molecule through animal testing into human testing. and the best estimates that that would take a year or more. Some researchers are much more optimistic. Researchers are, are used to be one. We're always optimistic and you never know what might happen, but I think it would be very unrealistic to expect a vaccine is going to be here to do anything to, Im 
to impact on the current phase of, of an international outbreak. Minister Hunt, Minister Hunt, despite well, which support the treatment. So there's the issue of the vaccine, which yeah. deals with the virus, but then there's also the issue of the, the treatment that can be available, which can moderate, obviously, the severity of the impact. And that's important, particularly when you're talking about older patients as well. So, um, and the private sector equally is investing quite a lot on, on that front as well. Minister yeah. Hunt, the spike in General pu members of the general public getting tested unnecessarily was somewhat sparked by a misinterpreted comment of your own on Sunday, the line, if in doubt, get tested, which was obviously specifically in the context of if you were one of the at-risk groups or a medical professional. Does that, in your mind, highlight the importance of very clear public messaging? And as a uh, result I of that, when can we expect the public health campaign to launch? Look, I think that's a very important question on two fronts. Uh, one, as uh, you've noticed, a uh, particular news agency, uh, not yours, uh, had to issue a clarification that they had excluded the very conditions which Professor Murphy set out, that if you've been in a high-risk area or if you've been in contact and you have symptoms, then that's appropriate and that's the time to, uh, to seek the advice and the testing. Unfortunately, that organisation uh, excluded that. It took a while, but we got the clarification. And, uh, I th and so this is a message to all of us and it wasn't intentional, by the way. Uh, so it's a message to all of us uh, to make sure that we're reporting carefully and fully. But equally for us, we've already begun our uh, communications in terms of what we're providing on uh, online and the uh, advice, but that will roll out progressively uh, over the coming period in terms of uh, further online, uh, uh, radio and electronic, uh, and uh, other means of communicating with Australians. So that's, uh, that's an ongoing process. Mark? Uh, I mean, can, can pensioners and other welfare recipients expect to get some form of cash payment or other benefit from your stimulus? I, I have more to say about that tomorrow with the Treasurer, and that's when we'll announce those measures. We're still finalising uh, some of those measures after what was a very lengthy meeting yesterday. The Treasury, together with other departments, have been working very solidly on putting, pulling together what is a very well-balanced package. Um, Obviously, stimulus will form part of that. I've been very clear about that. Um, and those who have been around this place for a, a long time will know that the Coalition actually supported uh, stimulus back in the first round in response to the global financial crisis. Now, that's exactly what we did. There were two tranches to that stimulus at that time. The first one uh, acted and worked through the existing payment mechanisms. Um, and that was able to be able to put through fairly quickly. The coalition supported those measures at that time. Uh, so you know, these are measures that the government has been looking closely at. I have said from this platform and others that uh, we need to address the demand side and supply side. Uh, but what the package is all about is keeping Australians in jobs, keeping business in business and ensuring that the Australian economy and the businesses that form that economy bounce back stronger on the other side of this. It's it's important to understand the economic impacts of this are highly connected to the health crisis and the life of the virus. These viruses have a, have a trajectory. They have a life cycle. And that is not indefinite. Um, how long that is is still not clear, but it is clear that these have finite lives and, and, and it'll have a finite impact on the economy. And that's why the, the principles that I set out yesterday that there's a clear fiscal exit strategy, that the measures are, are timely uh, but targeted, that they're proportionate. Um, this is what has been carefully weighed up by the government as we prepare uh, to put that in place. And uh, what will happen is we'll announce those measures tomorrow. Um, I'll have the opportunity then to take uh, specifically the premiers and chief ministers uh, through that on Friday. Uh, state governments then will make their own decisions, as some already have, about what role they want to play uh, and what role they can play. I mean, they have, um, they have payroll taxes, they have a range of other things that, uh, and, and levers that they can pull. They have local governments, uh, they have uh, road works maintenance programs, they have a range of things that uh, they have available to them, and I'm sure they will consider those in the same way, but I think it's important that they can do that after they've seen the totality of what the government's response has been. Um, the legislation that will support all of those measures um, uh, that will be developed over the course of the next week and when Parliament returns we'll be able to move quickly uh, to take that through the Parliament. Well, the mic over here. For... Oh, sorry, Michelle. Dr Murphy, 
but do you think it's likely that America will become the next big problem country with this disease? So I think America uh, has is a has more more cases than we have, and I think they were, uh, by their own admission, a bit slow in getting testing, but they have very good, robust Centre for Disease Control and public health systems, and I'm, they're working very, very actively now at trying to contain the outbreaks in America. So it's a little hard to predict at this stage, but obviously we're watching that closely. Uh, Dr Murphy referred to testing. Uh, the latest advice we have from the National Incident Centre this morning is that we have now had approximately 20,000 tests in Australia, which puts us very much at the global forefront. That's right. For sure. The, um, uh, Senator Rex Patrick has suggested that the parliamentary timetable should be changed. Can you envisage any circumstances in which you think that should be done? Well, we have no plans to change the parliamentary sitting schedule um, based on the information that we have. Yeah, what do you say to employers who think that a declaration of isolation should have I mean, you, Andrew, you, you've had one go. I'm happy to come back to you, but there's lots of people here. Just on your aged care package, there yeah. are some reports of insufficient personal protective gear in aged care centres. Mm. Is there specific funding for that, or will they be prioritised um, in terms of the national stockpile? Yeah. Yeah. So I can answer that. So uh, we have capacity to assist through the national stockpile, and uh, where there are any organisations that uh, do have uh, issues, uh, there's the capacity to uh, work through the primary health networks, and uh, if they do have shortfalls, uh, we'll be assisting them. Mm. On Indigenous Australians, Andrew, dear man, you're under. Uh, you'll uh, burst if he doesn't. Uh, what, uh, Prime Minister, what do you say to employers who believe that uh, um, a declaration of isolation, self-isolation, perhaps a declaration by Brendan Murphy himself, um, uh, lifts the obligation of them paying a wage to their employees? Well, uh, look, everyone's cases will be, will be different depending. Um, on, on what their health situation is, I think that's fair to say. I'm, I'm just going to repeat what I said yesterday when I spoke to the, to the business group in Sydney. All of us have a role to play, and large businesses in particular have an important role to play. Uh, large businesses have much stronger balance sheets. They're in a position to um, take actions to support their employees. Um, I th I've highlighted, I think, the example of Qantas is a very positive one. Um, one that is seeking to make use of the, 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 the flexibility it has when that's where the people are taking leave um, or uh, things of that nature, um, where people are in a position um, where they have to, to isolate, uh, either um, have an obligation to or otherwise. I'd be encouraging employees to take a, a flexible and forward-leaning approach in supporting their employees during this process. They'll need their people on the other side. And businesses, particularly large businesses, you know, they will be watched closely, I think, through the, the months ahead. You know, businesses spend a lot of time talking about the value and integrity of their brands. Well, their brands will be defined in these months ahead. The government will be leaning heavily on its balance sheet that we've taken great care uh, to put in good order in bringing the budget back to balance to be able to, to respond to this. Equally, uh, large businesses are in a similar position and that's why, you know, again, I, I give credit where it's due in terms of the banks passing on the 25 basis point rate cut, uh, the first time all four of them have done that in five years. And I think that is a demonstration of, I think, their willingness uh, to do that. So, I, look, I, I would urge people to be practical about these things, uh, to be sensible about these things, to act with a sense of... Uh, uh, good faith to both towards employees and towards employers about how you, you manage these issues. Getting through this is all of our responsibility. Acting with a sense of common sense, I think, with a sense of uh, uh, patience, uh, with calmness and uh, having, I think, an assurance about the arrangements that are being put in place, whether at a government level or otherwise. Last question. Dr Murphy, what is Australia's testing capacity, how many tests can we get through in a day or a week, and can you explain a little more about the plans to extend testing, please, to aged care um, and doctors? So uh, at, the mo at the moment, most of the testing has been done in our public health labs, but with these measures announced today, 
uh, by increased Medicare funding. All of the private laboratories, many of whom have already started doing testing, they are all scaling up rapidly to do testing and they will do as many tests as we require. They, they, they have huge capacity. These can be automated assays and they can scale up enormously as needed. So we haven't set a number on that. They'll do as many as needed. What we want to have is the capacity for people to get a test with essentially a same day turnaround. And that's, that's going to be uh, our aim throughout this. In terms of aged care, we will be specifically looking, because we don't want to uh, have difficulties in aged care getting testing, we'll, we will be looking at pathology companies possibly going into aged care facilities, taking the tests and coming out to make it easier for the facility and, uh, and for the residents. But we're working through those measures. No, we're not testing people without symptoms at the moment. There is no value in testing people without symptoms. Uh, the, currently our approach is testing, and that's the international approach, is testing people who have respiratory symptoms and who have been a return traveller or who are a contact. Just to clarify, your, your efforts to limit the number of tests is not about uh, the, the, uh, sort of a limitation on the number we have available, it's about the same day turnaround, is that correct? So same day turnaround is important, but what I'm saying we're not testing asymptomatic people is because there's no value. If you, if you think you've been in contact with someone and you have a test that's negative, it doesn't mean at all that you're not incubating the virus, because you may not shed the virus until you're symptomatic. So that's why we're not favouring doing tests on asymptomatic people. So the, the challenge, we want to test the people for whom it's appropriate to test, and to get quick results. Just on Indigenous Australians, can you just on Indigenous Australians, can you explain why those specific measures are being taken to target those at-risk groups? Uh, so one of the things which is is very clear uh, is that uh, we know that in many Indigenous communities, uh, in particular, you can have uh, health challenges, uh, and also in a close community, uh, transmission can occur easily. Uh, the uh, Primary health uh, systems have emphasised the importance of that, uh, the Chief Medical Officer and the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and also working with the states and territories. So we've all recognised that. That's why we're uh, providing two additional forms of support. One is uh, uh, the telehealth capacity for the over 50 uh, Indigenous Australians based on the, the relative health uh, position, and then secondly, uh, the preparedness and uh, retrieval and treatment support for remote communities. Uh, so I couldn't provide. quite hear you, Catherine. Sorry, just referencing your answer before mm. about business yep. uh, and stepping up and doing the right thing. Mm. Will the government provide any support to businesses in the stimulus package to cover entitlements for work for casual workers, for people who are not uh, not you know yeah. don't qualify for sick pay? I have another one. I'm sorry, sorry, Prime Minister. Yep, sorry. I have another one. I have yep. another one. Sorry. Uh, Bridget McKenzie says she made, in her statement on Thursday night, says she made no changes to either the ministerial brief or the spreadsheets in relation to the sports grants after April 4. The Audit Office told Senate estimates that changes were made to the spreadsheets uh, on April 10 and April 11, one at the request of your office. So who made these changes uh, after April 4? and on what legal authority, given that my understanding is that ministerial advisers cannot, cannot uh, uh, make decisions in the way ministers can make decisions. The ministerial authority for the program was with the Minister for Support. Um, that, that is the position. On the other issue that you raised tomorrow, I'll be back here with the Treasurer. We'll be outlining what I believe will be a, a well-targeted, proportionate, uh, appropriate response to address the very real economic challenges that are being presented uh, by the coronavirus here in Australia. Importantly, it'll be a response that is focused on the challenges we have here in Australia. Uh, we're not trying to solve problems that are occurring in other countries or in, in the dimension of the economic challenge. There are in other countries. We're tailoring this to deal with the challenges that we face here in Australia. And uh, that program is comprehensive as it addresses both supply and demand uh, side uh, issues, it deals with investment issues, uh, it ensures uh, that we can put Australia in the best possible position uh, to bounce back, to bounce back strongly economically, to support people's jobs, to keep business in business and to ensure that we are even stronger on the other side. Thank you very Thank you. much.